Oh yeah. I wanted to have a more positive takeaway from this show and I just don't have it. Anyway, let's get this over with. Hey, this is the Sword and the Pen Reflections. It is my casual alternative to the formal channel, the Sword and the Pen, link up there. I do actually have a video that I've been waiting to upload there, but I just haven't. It's got a lot of copyright blocks, but I'll get to it eventually, I promise. Anyway, if you're here, you know the deal. So let's jump into it. We're on season two, episode four of The Wheel of Time and uh, it's corresponding chapters, which I didn't bother to look up what they are, but maybe at the end of doing this, I will look it up and stick it in right now. Before we keep going, I'm gonna take a couple seconds to say a big thank you to my fifth ever My Precious Tier patron, John the Stoic. John, you have been a patron of mine for a while, but at a lower tier level, I don't know why you suddenly thought, you know what, she deserves more. But my gosh, thank you. At some point, I think I might actually be celebrating having achieved the dream life. Enjoying a few well and comfort. Until then though, thank you. And I do hope that I can continue making videos that you enjoy. Anyway, so yeah, let's go. As I said in the teaser at the beginning of this, I just have zero investment in the characters in the show. I am enjoying, and actually I have finished The Dragon Reborn and I gotta say, for the first time, Nynaeve, one of her scenes just really captured my attention and it was such a mundane scene. It was the one where Nynaeve is sitting down with another wisdom and they're kind of testing each other on you know, what they know about uh, herbal medicine and you know things like that. I was so hooked on that scene. I don't know why, maybe because I felt like Nynaeve was being portrayed as really smart and I liked seeing her try to match wits with somebody who had about the same level of knowledge of her as, as she did. And, and then at the end, they came to this like, place of mutual respect for each other. So uh, I, I did really enjoy this. I think I'll probably get more into discussing some of the things that I really liked about it as we go on with our reviews of uh, season two. And I have ordered the next book. It is on its way. Probably won't get here uh, for a couple of days, but I've started the audiobook. So... Okay, our cold open starts with Ishamael walking through a really cool location. I love it when shows actually use interesting locations, and this is a good one. I think I've seen it in other movies before, but none of them are coming to mind. Anyway, so he comes across another one of those uh, those seals, the Quendiar seals that we saw at the Eye of the World, and he says a bunch of stuff in the old tongue, and we see that he sets free what we can all assume is one of the other Forsaken, and it's a female drenched in blood who comes from a, a sort of crouched position into a standing position. She's covered in blood and she sticks her arm out. Wow, that was just like Carrie. I thought she was gonna kill us all. I really liked this cold open. I feel like this is good because it makes you wonder what is he doing? Now, the first cold open that we had at the beginning of the season was Ashamael talking to all his other underlings at that table, you know, with the little uh, Tuatha on girl. And they didn't really say that they had any plans for Rand. Like it didn't look like they were doing anything that might affect our bad guys. They literally just got together and were chatting. This, even though he doesn't explain that there's any plan, we see that he has done something that is major. He has woken one of the other Forsaken. It's somebody who's obviously sinister, I mean, covered in the blood. And we assume this is gonna be somebody who's going to be trouble for our good guys. It's not the same thing as just talking to a bunch of other bad guys who are regular humans. This is a Forsaken. We know this is a very powerful force. So we, we see that there's some sort of a plan in action here. I liked this cold open. I thought it was really good. Would have been kind of interesting, actually, if this was, and I'm talking about the show only, if this was the cold open that we got at the very beginning. But then, of course, I think it would have given away the big reveal. When I saw this, actually, the first time, I, I figured right away who it was. But I think if you'd had this in episode one, maybe it would have made it obvious to people who've never read the books before. Either way, I liked it. I really loved the music. I thought it felt sinister and grand at the same time. It had a very unique sound to it. So this is like the most positive thing that I have to say so far about season two is I really liked this cold open. I thought it was great because honestly, up until now, I haven't felt like the bad guys are all that bad of bad guys, especially Ishamael. And this kind of implied, thanks to the presence of the blood, I believe that something really big and bad is coming. Next, we've got the old lady that Rand was talking to at the party in the previous episode. She's um, getting herself dressed for the day and um, goes into her little study where you can see that she's a painter and she's been painting. And her butler type guy comes in. There's someone at the door. It's early for a visitor. Who? 
It's, um, it's your older sister. Her secret, moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. Although I kind of like this, uh, I, I wasn't aware that Moraine has any other siblings outside of just this one. So when the butler says it's your older sister, that, that implies that there's a younger sister somewhere else out there. And I don't think that's the case. And now this is not the worst thing ever, but it, it is a little bit sloppy and a little bit like, <laughs> you know, oh, just in case you didn't quite catch it, this is the older sister. And then when you see her and she's younger, you go like, we should, I think they were hoping that the audience would be like, oh my gosh, she's so much younger looking, but she's older. Like, you know, it's a little too on the nose. Maybe in the scene before where she was talking to Rand, she talked about how she has this older sister who goes off and does something. I don't know. You know, that that would have been something that then when we get to this, we see this is the lady and we remember that she had an older sister. And then when the butler comes in, he just says, your sister's here. And then if people forgot about what happened in the previous scene, well, they can catch it in the rewatch, you know, be subtle with these kind of setups. That's just what I would have done. Anyway, okay, moving on. Immediately, Maureen establishes herself yet again as being super unlikable. I mean, you can tell that this lady, this older lady is, you know, like very, this is a, a, a much anticipated meeting. She hasn't seen her sister in a while, we can presume. We don't even have to be told that, we just kind of get it. There's tension here. Maureen comes in and essentially just starts like barking orders at her. Like, I've stabled my horse and I would like my own room back. and. You know, I, I want to keep a low profile. And the sister establishes herself as being very accommodating, being like going, oh, okay, yes, I understand you need to keep a low profile. And then Moraine just brushes her off and calls the butler guy back in. It's like, bring me some red wine and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, sir, Gunnery Sergeant Highway, sir. This man has no social graces. And finally, the sister's had it. And she's like, dude, it's been... How long did she say? 30 years? It's been a long time. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's been 30 years, you know essentially shut up and sit down. Good for her. So I, I really liked the sister for standing up to her, to, to Maureen, because this is how Maureen has been through the entirety of the series, especially season two. She just steamrolls over everybody. And this is not a good way. And I don't mean morally good. I mean, this is not a, uh, uh, an intelligent way to go about your life, to be constantly steamrolling everybody. Eventually, you're gonna try to roll over the wrong person and it's gonna come back to bite you in the ass. And I like that this sister here immediately stands up to her. So I'm like on the side of the sister. Anything that she says or does, I'm on her side already. And Maureen, I don't give a shit about you. I, I just don't want you in the show anymore. She adds nothing positive to the story so far in this season. She come in and quickly become leader and the we get so sick of her bossy, bossy behavior. And now she got to go. But yeah, so the sister says, you know, she calms down after being very upset at being steamrolled and says, you know, why don't you have a seat and let's have some tea. Like she wants to, she wants this to be a positive encounter and she is, she is willing to swallow her own pain at being treated like this to have an amicable relationship with her sister. And Maureen, very coldly, all she has to say is, maybe lunch, I've got something I gotta go do, bye. And she just leaves. Right now, one of our members is a real B word. We're getting ready to do something about it. I don't think that the show writers want us to like Maureen because she's been nothing but unlikable from episode one. The next scene with Maureen, she's in her room. She's looking at an old dollhouse and like a music box and just like childhood things. I do have to say that I really like the set in this house. I feel like it's it's populated well. And I don't mean with people, but with items that would indicate this is a lived in house. It's not just the dust, but you know, there's lots of things. Like even back in the first scene with the older sister in her study, you could see that there were paintbrushes on her desk. And in the corner, you could see that there were uh, paintings that she had painted a while ago up against the wall. <laughs> we spared no expense. Um, including one that I believe was of herself and her sister and her son. And I, I don't 
quite recall who the other person was, but either way, it doesn't matter. It just, it, this was like a set that was thought out, you know, let's have some history in this house. So I like this. And um, her dress, now Moraine's dress that she's wearing here is actually the dress that I would have imagined her arriving in um, the Two Rivers in season one. In the book, she's described as wearing a dress that to me would have been this one. I know that's just a tiny detail, but when you have a big fan base, people who really, really love your book series, any opportunity that the art department can take something directly from the books and put it on screen is like a little Easter egg or it's like a little like nod to the fans. Like we know that this is something that everybody has enjoyed. So I would have liked to have seen this. Then they tried to do their own thing, which is not always terrible either. But imagine how many times we watched The Lord of the Rings and looked for things that we remember directly from the book. I actually recall a scene where uh, Ian McKellen was interviewed and he said that he was telling um, who's the actor who played Sam. It's when they arrive in Rivendell the first time. He says, when you get there, run over to Frodo, who remember you thought was dying when you last saw him and take hold of his hand. From the book, this is a moment. And he said, the fans of the book will be looking for little moments like that. You should put it in there. And so he did. Sean Astin, that was his name. Sean Astin went over and he grabbed Elijah Wood's hand. It, you can see it right there in the movie. And that's taken directly from the book. And even though it's just a tiny little detail, it just shows the level of, of thought put into how can we bring stuff from the books that the fans of the books will notice and say, wow, they did that for me. There was no reason for that to happen, but they did it. And it was, I feel like it was there because they wanted to accurately portray what was in the book. That's the sort of thing that you really wanna see in faithful adaptations. But of course, this is a very loose adaptation, if we can even call it an adaptation at this point. But anyway, that that's just one of those things that I wanted to note about this particular moment, this costume anyway. She goes out of her room and she sees her older sister and the butler talking uh, quietly to each other. And this would have been the moment where she should have paused and waited for her sister to notice her, but she clearly didn't want to be noticed by her. She grabs a bottle of wine off of the table, which was the wine that she uh, requested before. And it was the same type of wine that Loghain had asked Rand to go and find for him. It was so rare and hard to find before. And then she just bugs out. And she goes over to the insane, insane asylum, which I seem to have difficulty saying, insane asylum. Loghain starts chuckling to himself in his little insane way when she comes in. Says, you know, I ought to kill you where you stand. She's like, well, uh, you tried once before, that didn't work. She starts asking, like, so how are they treating you here? And he goes, like, a butterfly without wings. And she's like, and how about your mind? And somehow this has clued into Loghain that she is the one who had him sent to this insane asylum instead of being in a cell at the White Tower. How in the world did you figure that out? ESP again, Jen. <laughs> in the second book, we encounter Loghain in the halls. We're, I think we're with Egwene. I believe we're with Egwene, or maybe it's Nynaeve. Doesn't matter. Either way, we're with the girls when uh, they come across a man who looks disheveled and insane, but not insane. I guess, no, he doesn't look insane. He just looks disheveled and like super depressed. Like he even makes a comment about wishing that he could kill himself. But he seems to be very well taken care of. And he's like a, a figure of pity for the White Tower. They feel bad for him. They don't like want to torment him, which is what the show did with him in season one. Um, Suan was basically like, oh, we're going to study you and you're never going to get to die. And that's going to be great for us, even though you're going to wish you could be dead. It was very cold and it was, uh, yeah, it was just cruel. But in the books, he was a he was a person who I Sedai pitied. And that's kind of what I think Loghain is implying in the show, or they're trying to show that this is what he's implying, that he would have been treated better at the White Tower. I don't know why from within the context of the show itself, he thought that's what would have happened. Like, why would he want to go back to the White Tower? Well, I can think of two reasons. I mean, Suan did say to him that if he had stayed at the tower, he was going to essentially be tortured for the rest of his life. I'm a kind of kinky. So here in this episode, when he's upset at Moraine, because he seems to be upset, you're the reason I'm here instead of a cell at the White Tower. Why would he be upset about that? And then Moraine reminds him like, well, 
you know, if you were at the White Tower, my the Yellow Sisters and the Brown Sisters wanted to study you. Like, that's what they would have done. He should have known this. I mean, his last moments that we saw of him in the White Tower were of him, like, please just kill me. Please kill me. Don't make me live and be your test subject. On your knees. Oh, yes, my queen! I will be your slave forever! <laughs> so I'm not... I, I just don't get this. Like, it seems like what he's experiencing here at this nut house is what, in the book, he was kind of experiencing at the White Tower. So, I would have told the writers that he could maybe be miserable here, but kind of wishing he had more interactions with people. I, I, don't, know, I don't even know what the hell I would have told the writers of this show, because I would have told them so many other things where this wouldn't have been a problem. So... Anyway, moving on, let's go. Please like, subscribe, and comment, even if it's just with an emoji. It's a free way to support the channel. Or if you're feeling super generous, check out my Patreon, Ko-fi, or hit the Money Heart Thanks button down below. You can become a monthly patron or just leave me a one-time tip. Now let's get back to the show. So then Moraine reveals that she doesn't know where Rand is staying, but she does reveal that she sent him there. She goes, you know, so uh, have you started training him yet, Rand Althor? And then when she asks, where is he staying? You can, the music changes and you can see the wheels turning in Loghain's head like she doesn't know where he is. <laughs> and he essentially says like, do you really think that I'm gonna dance like a puppet on your strings just for a bottle of wine? I really enjoyed seeing Moraine's stupid moves coming to bite her in the ass because she has created this problem for herself in the show. In the show, she's not nearly as intelligent and clever as she is in the books. At this point in the show, she should not be succeeding in anything. So good job there. I like that Loghain is smarter than she is at this point. Okay, but then unfortunately, this next bit is not very smart <laughs> on Loghain's part at all. She says, okay, you know, I know that you're not willing to help me for, you know, a bottle of wine, but I know what you really want. And she's like, I know what everyone who's been cut off from the one power really wants. And she pulls out a knife. Happy birthday, bitch. I just have to say, now this is book accurate. This is what he wanted in the book. He wanted a knife, but he was like under constant watch of the Aes Sedai in the White Tower. Like there was literally guards on him who were making sure that he couldn't do anything to hurt himself. Here, he's all by himself in this garden. There are so many ways that he could have killed himself. How about in the last scene that we saw him in where he threw this bottle of wine across the courtyard and I'm assuming it smashed and it was probably made out of pottery. So you know what? He could easily have taken some of those shards of the pottery and sliced himself up to the point that he would bleed out. This is not an intelligent person. I mean, I understand that they tried to do what it was in the book, that they tried to be accurate to the book in this moment. Like Maureen's gonna offer him the thing that he clearly wanted in The Dragon Reborn, or not The Dragon Reborn, The Great Hunt. But the thing is, is that it wasn't set up that there's a reason why he couldn't do anything about it before. I mean, there are a million things he could have done to end his life with nobody watching because literally nobody is watching him. Just not very well thought out. But yeah, so Loghain tells her everything that he knows. He's uh, staying at an inn and he is just as powerful as I was, but he is afraid of the one power, so he can't use it. And um, then she basically says, you're gonna teach Rand everything you know about how to channel. And if I'm satisfied with that, then I'll give you the thing that you want. And that's that. The Crescent Inn burned down. Do you know why? Things burn in the foregate all the time, my lady. There was a boy staying there. You would have seen him every day come through these gates for work. What about him? Do you know where he is now? Ah, uh, look, I didn't see nothing here, okay? <laughs> right. Then Moraine comes home and it's well past bedtime, I would assume. And uh, she looks like for a moment she's hesitant, like maybe I'll go talk to my sister, but then she's like, no way, I'm going to bed. And so she, she walks past her sister's room, assuming her sister is in there. But the older, the baby sister is in her room and has clearly been waiting for her. She's like, well, excuse the intrusion, but I didn't want to miss you. And the sister gives Moraine the verbal smackdown that would 
demoralize anybody and she should be just riddled with guilt. And I just don't see this affecting Moraine very much. And she should feel terrible about what she left her family with. What is implied in this conversation is that Moraine went off to become an Aes Sedai and like never spoke to her family again. Didn't even bother to write a letter to explain why she couldn't have come back and helped them. So she, the younger sister mentions all these times, like, like, look, I idolized you for half of my life. Like I, you were my big sister. And uh, Maureen's like, well, I'm not going to apologize for leaving and going to the White Tower. And she's like, an, <laughs> she does that thing where she says, I can't lie. And the younger sister is like, oh, no, I don't blame you for that. If I could have channeled and I tried, I certainly would have wanted to go too. She's like, but you know what? I always sort of hoped that you would come back to help us, you know, or that you would have done something to try to support us. Like when our, and she mentions when our uncle ruined us. So apparently the family was ruined by the uncle. And she just continues to lay it out there. And like, you know, our, our father always held out hope for you. You know, you were his shining star. I mean, this should just be destroying Moraine. And uh, she's like, but it turns out you were just like a shooting star. You just, you know, never to come back into our sky uh, ever again once you were out of it. And Moraine tries to give some excuse. Like, I would have come back if I could. And thank goodness the sister cuts her off. And he's like, you know what? I don't want to hear about it. Like, I'm sure that you were busy with your thing, but I don't think it was any more demanding than what I was busy with. And then she starts um, talking about all the things that she had to do to like, just keep their family alive. She's like, um, you, I've had people, she, she doesn't say I have had people, but she says, uh, unless, she's like, I'm sure that what you had was no more or less demanding than what I had. It's like, unless of course you were taught how to, you know, hold your head up high after somebody has spit you and spit at you in the face, or, um, you know, you've had to beg one of the servants for a party's leftovers. Our household went through horrible things. And we know that the Aes Sedai and the White Tower basically live like royalty, like they are at the pinnacle of power in the world. And the younger sister says that, you know, well, you know what, my son is going to marry the queen and no one's ever going to, you know, <laughs> spit in my eye ever again. Like our, and basically she's implying like I had to work my ass off in order to rebuild our family's status to the point that her son is now marrying the queen. So yeah, then Moraine is like, you've done very well, little sister, much better with the hand you were dealt than I would have done with it. You know, <laughs> and I, I'm so happy that the sister didn't fall for her. She's like, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. She's like, the only reason I'm here isn't to like gain your approval. It is basically to tell you, you're not gonna screw up what I spent my lifetime building. This is not your house. This is not your city. And I'm not your little sister anymore. All the eyes and ears you had here, they're mine now. The head of the sanitarium, Celestine. The guard you hailed at the gate, Sandel. If you want to know where that red-headed boy in the inn went, you're going to have to ask me very nicely over tea. She got your ass. I am just loving this old broad. <laughs> like, yes, give it to her. This is what I want. I want to see Maureen get slapped around and this old lady is doing it. So well done, old broad. I can't remember her name. It doesn't really matter. I mean, she's not in the book, at least not any of the books I've read so far. And as far as from Maureen's point of view is concerned, we don't really see much more of her in this episode with the exception of when her storyline uh, intersects with Rand's. And we'll get to that when we get to Rand's story. But uh, the implication is that she did do as her little sister demanded, which was to ask very nicely over tea. I sure would have liked to have seen that moment when she says, you know what, okay, I, I'm so sorry. I have been horrible to you guys all this time. And, and she had to play the game right. She couldn't just threaten somebody. I wish I could have seen that. And if I recall properly, the next time that we see her confronting her little sister about this, she essentially goes right back to threats again. So I, this should have been like her learning a lesson in how to maintain a positive relationship with people so that you can get from them what you want. Like this is these are the consequences of not being respectful towards other people. So, oh, but that's not what happens. 
<sighs> time to just move on. I think y'all know what I mean, but when we get to that part in the next episode, I think it's the next episode or maybe the one after that, we'll discuss it more there. Okay, now we're moving on to Lan, and he's still dressed like a freaking hippie, even though we're not in the uh, Nynaeve's daydream anymore. I, I just don't like this look. I don't like it at all, but it's just my personal opinion, so just whatever. Anyway, they're in this village and there's lots of kids and Alana is basically serving lunch, I think, to everybody. And, um... What are you just smoking about? It's been a while since you brought a new man home, huh? Uh, Where does the third one go now? <laughs> I'm just tired of the sex jokes. They're not funny and it's... I think if I enjoyed these characters more, I might be more into it. And Alana has been a mostly likable character up until now, but everybody else is just garbage, so I don't... Eh. It's like too little too late, right? That's just me. I don't know. But yeah, Alana like gives this like, wouldn't you like to know where they go? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so... Ugh. Ah, moving on. Oh yeah. I've been in Maxim busy. Huh? One of them always checks on me when I step away. How does it usually go? What a gross scene. Wh why would you film this? It's gross. And <laughs> Alana is like, yeah, you cut him while he's peeing, gets a tree. <laughs> this is nasty. I mean, <laughs> The staging is not good. They could have had this conversation anywhere. She could have been waiting for him when he came back from the trees, but no, she's gonna stand right behind him, staring at him while he's taking a piss. It's so gross. But yeah, so basically Lan is like, you know, oh, I figured, you know, at some point it was gonna be you because it's usually either one of your, you know, one of your two warders who are talking to me. And she's like, oh, how does it usually go? What do you guys talk about? And She's like, well, they try to, you know, first they tease me, they comment on my age or my hair or something like that. And then they'll talk about a warm memory, like basically reasons to live kind of things. They are informing the audience of what Lan has been going through in the time since Moraine left. As Lan is starting to describe this, Alana immediately like, I don't think you're gonna kill yourself. So we're not gonna talk about any of that other stuff. She says, your bond was not ripped from you, she took it. Did I miss something? No, she didn't. They they have not, the show, I really have a problem with this. I know I keep bringing it up in other videos, but I'm gonna mention it here again. Nobody has clarified exactly what the situation is with Lan. I think the one thing that this does clarify is that the bond no longer exists, okay? The bond is over, it's gone, no longer exists. Okay, but here she says, the bond wasn't ripped from you, she took it. It was ripped from him if she took it. And she didn't take it. The bond just ceased to exist because all her power was gone, right? This is not, like, this is just a poor use of the English language, a, a lack of understanding of what is being said here. Because what is being said makes no sense. It's, <laughs> she says it wasn't ripped from you, she took it. Isn't that ripping the bond from somebody? Sounds like it to me. And it also isn't accurate to what has happened in the show. She didn't take the bond from him. Ishamael did. Or in this case, she sort of said, the dark one took it from you or something like that. Like, moving on uh, before I go insane. Okay, so as, as disgustingly as this scene uh, started out, the, the writing of the rest of it is actually pretty good, or at least it's not terrible. She says, have you decided what it is that you want to do? So at this point, we've established that Lan is not being forced to stay with them, or that's what this implies. Like she's been giving him the opportunity to decide what he wants to do, which sort of made the threat that Moraine did in the last episode with him, you know, like, you better go with her or she's gonna force you to bond with her. Like, what What was the point of that? But anyway, so apparently it's been Lan's choice to be with her all this time. He's like, well, have I worn out my welcome with you guys? And she's like, well, we're going back to the White Tower tomorrow. And um, do you want to come with us? And he's like, I don't know. So he's still indecisive. And then she tells him about how Nynaeve is going to go through the arches. So I don't know if this is supposed to have taken place before that happened or after, like, because, you know, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter that much. But he decides that, you know, okay, so she, she's basically said she's going to become an Aes Sedai. Like, she, this is the fastest that we've ever had sent somebody to the arches ever since some famous other Aes Sedai. 
And um, she's like, she's going to be looking for a warder. And he's like, I'm not going to repeat my same mistakes twice. I'm like, okay. Now, in the book, this opportunity was never presented to Lan, at least not, not through the first three books. Maybe it happens later on. But right now, as where I'm at, I'm going, okay, I get there would be loyalty. He wants to go back and be with Maureen, but it does diminish what is supposed to be the love between him and Nynaeve. Even though I never bought it in the show, it felt so forced to me. Like there was no chemistry even between these two characters and nothing to build up that they have this great love or respect even for each other. And then he basically told her, even if you become an Aes Sedai, I, you know, and you can get married, I'm not going to marry you. Despite all that happening, now the, the, the opportunity has come up. Moraine has ditched him and taken off. She's essentially said, I'm okay with somebody else forcing you to be bonded to them, which is like horrible. It's like, basically, I'm a, I have told somebody else it's okay with me if they force you into enslavement. Like, why would you want to be with this person? But I, I feel like this would have been an opportunity for him to be like, yes, I do want to go and be with Nynaeve. Like, we should see him wanting to do that. He shouldn't so easily just say, I don't want to repeat the same mistake. Because now it's like, oh, okay, so he had the opportunity to go and be with Nynaeve, but he decided not to. So their love really wasn't much. It was exactly as I thought it was in the show. It, it was nothing. He's a player. He's a player. Whereas in the book, they have like, he has given Nynaeve a ring, like almost a ring as though to promise himself to her or like to sh as a sign of his love for her. It, it just, I feel like if this had happened in the book, he would have gone after her. He would have gone to her. Anyway, moving on. Then she says, I wish you could have known Moraine before. And he goes, before what? And she says, well, something happened to her about 20 years ago, about a year or two before she met you. And since then, she's never been the same. And he goes, was she happier before that? I don't know if she's ever been happy. Which I, I don't know why that line was necessary, because I think later in the show, we do see that Maureen was happy. But this is good foreshadowing. This is a good way to drop little hints to the audience that there's something that we want to know about. There's something that has happened to Moraine. We're expecting a revelation coming up later on. I mean, this this is the promise to the audience that there's information out there that is gonna explain why Moraine is the way that she is. So we should want to know that. Unfortunately, I don't give a shit about Moraine at all. I really couldn't care less if she's in the show or not. I mean, I'd actually prefer her not to be. But at this point, it's, at least well written in this scene that they are telling the audience there's something that you should want to know about without being too obvious about it. She's just reminiscing that Moraine was a different person before something big happened to her. Like she she hasn't always been this way. And then when Lan, you know, asks about it, we, we find out something happened to Moraine. To just say those words, something happened to her, makes us go, what? There was an event that happened. She didn't just gradually become this. She Something specific happened and she had like a sudden overnight change. So yes, well done there. I, I like it and I, well done in the writing. You did something right. Oh wait, I wanted it to go to my head. In the next scene, though, it appears that the writers have lost track of the amount of time that has passed between the last episode of the previous season and episode four of season two. Well, that didn't take long. So, okay, Lan is in his room. He's reading that poem that Moraine bought and he stuffs it into his saddlebag. And then, um, what's the name of the guy? Maxim, I think, something like the, the blondie comes in and he's like, hey, help me with the water. They're starting to make dinner. So they're out filling buckets of water and it's an obscene amount of buckets that they're filling up with water. And I don't know why they didn't just carry the buckets, whatever. Okay, does it, moving on. Okay, so here's the problem. You're doing really well. You know that, right? Usually the first few weeks after the bond's been broken. I don't need to tell you. Well, I've had my share of practice without it. Moraine has left the bond mast for the last six months or so. How long has it been, though, since the bond was broken? I thought it has been like five or six months. It wasn't masked then. It was gone. I'm so confused as to what the hell this even means. Is this supposed to be some sort of a subtle hint that all the other Aes Sedai think that Moraine still has the one power, that she's just ripped it from Lan? And wouldn't... I, this is confusing as hell. 
The two ladies that Lana and Maureen were staying with before knew that Maureen was cut off from the One Power, but this seems to be implying that Ilana does not know. So does Maureen trust those other two Aes Sedai more than she trusts Ilana? Is that what is being implied here? Like, this is quite confusing. And it would have been nice if somebody had spelled it out because up until now, I was under the assumption that Alana knows what is going on because at this point, she wrote to Alana and said, you better get your ass over here. It's really important that you uh, take Lan away like so I can leave and he's not going to be with me. And unless she knew that Moraine was cut off from the bond, what, what would she assume? Like, wouldn't she want to know, like, what's going on? Like, I'm, I'm not going to come over there and take, like, I'm close with my warders. I have a respect and love for them. And I see what you what you're telling me to do with Lan, and I think it's evil. So I would want an explanation for what's going on or something. And what I'm seeing here is that Alana just like, oh. Moraine said, can you please do something horrible to a human being that we both love and respect for me? And she was like, okay. And I guess that's more important than me being there for the most powerful Aes Sedai that we've seen in a thousand years as she goes through the arches. Like, it's more important that I be there to protect her at the White Tower, that I go and I should go and, and help you possibly by enslaving someone against their will. Like that, that's more important. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is, now we're making Alana look like a really horrible person. I'm, the, the dots are not being connected here. This is not making sense. So either Alana is a terrible person or she knows that Lan, that Moraine is cut off from the One Power. Why wouldn't she know if those other two Aes Sedai ladies know? Was it a big secret? If it was a big secret, why did those other two ladies know? I just, oh. God, give me patience! I, I don't even care to think about it anymore. Let's just move on. So Maxon then reveals to Lan that he has been uh, shielded from the bond or whatever for six months or more at a time. Um, and th this is, I guess, not common practice like this. And he, Lan is even like, does the tower know about this? He says, when I first bonded to Alana, I didn't like having an audience in my head and Alana didn't like the show. So this is implying that Maxim got into this bond with Alana just to be with Yvonne, the other warder. Like it, he doesn't give a shit about being bonded to Alana. It's about Yvonne. So he's enslaved himself to someone else for this guy, which I mean, okay, I can, you know, this is a very lovely gesture. But it does beg the question, Alana, knowing exactly what was what he was asking, like allowed this to happen. And then she's like, I didn't like being in his head. And and he doesn't like, you know, having a show like she knew that she had to have known this was not going to work out. It should be, I would imagine that the warder really wants to be bonded in this way with the Aes Sedai. I mean, to me, this just shows the flaw in their relationship, that this is not a good, this is an unhealthy um, combination here, that you've got a guy who is essentially locked into a relationship with this woman that he doesn't want to be locked into a relationship with. Like he just said, he doesn't want this. And he's doing it for this other guy who clearly doesn't appreciate it or like, I... I fell in love with a warder. I fell in love with an I said I. You always make me feel like the third wheel. Everyone is having, having fun, fun, fun. Because everything is nice and everyone is friendly. Not every place is having fun, fun, fun. Because everything is nice and everyone is friendly. So everyone is having, having fun. <laughs> this is not good. And for some reason, it's being portrayed as it works now. This is not a happy person. This is a person who is locked into a relationship with somebody else that he doesn't want to be locked into a relationship. He, he only wants to be with the guy, but he's stuck with her. He's enslaved to her. Ilana's not a good person. I thought she's supposed to be wise and like she's supposed to be much older, right? I mean, at least I guess they haven't identified if Ilana is older also like the others are, but you would assume she would have known and said, uh-uh. We don't get to be in a bond. I don't want to be with you and you don't want to be with me. We should not be bonded together. I mean, that was an awfully big risk to take that this is somebody who you're, okay, what's the solution? We're going to cut you off. He could have killed himself. 
He could have killed himself. I don't know. Whatever, anyway. But, uh, so Maxim basically tells, uh, yeah, so he, he explains that essentially I talked it over with Alana and Yvonne and the three of us decided that I would be masked at all times except for battle and in bed. I, I'm assuming that they, they, she reinstates the bond in bed because she wants it to be something that he seems to be enjoying, even though he just implied by saying that that's when it comes back on, he wouldn't want to otherwise. It's like she's drugging him. It's like she's roofing him so that she can have him in bed. Like that, that's what it is. That's, that's the equivalent situation here. He would not otherwise want to be with her in that situation. At least that's what I'm taking away from this, this description. If it wasn't for day rape, I'd never get laid. Anyway, Maxim says that everybody else is saying you can't go back and be with Moraine, but I'm proof that you can. I'm not 100% sure how this shows that you can. I just don't understand. I mean, yeah, it just doesn't, this is not, the correlation does not exist. So I, whatever. Okay, moving on. I'm not gonna think about it. I'm not gonna think about it anymore. We're just gonna keep going. Oh, dear Jesus. Keep to me straight. Like a Samsung. Like a King Davy. Like Incredible Hulk. Next, we've got Lan and Yvonne and Maxim are meditating and Maxim gets bored and immediately leaves or sneaks away. And the two left behind start <laughs> discussing him leaving. Like, oh, I, he lasted about 10 minutes this time. I'm like, yeah, soon he'll be old and wise like us. And Lan goes, yeah, the wise he's still, old, yes, the wise he's still working on. I don't think that Maxim's very wise. Um, so this was an accurate observation on his part. But then the conversation goes into Ivan, 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 whatever, saying that he understands why Lan is the way that he is. And, he, and I, I enjoyed this conversation because it was very accurate to life. He says, um, Did something she said? You keep saying it to yourself over and over. A thousand cuts for her one. People don't understand that we quiet ones. Quiet because the conversation's always playing out in our own heads. I like this. This is very accurate to real life, at least my experience uh, with <laughs> when people say, oh, why are you being quiet? Well, I'm thinking about a conversation, usually the same one over and over and over again. <laughs> who hasn't had that happen? I like this. This is a good, good bonding moment. And these are definitely the two who I would see bonding more than Max and, and Lan. So then Lan reveals what it is that he's thinking about. He says, Moraine said that all these years, she's never considered me her equal. And Yvonne just sort of laughs at that. And he's like, of course we're not their equal. I mean, they're like, basically like gods. And like the whole world sees them as gods and we see them in their weakness, their moments of weakness. Like that's what our role is. Essentially, we are the ones who remind them that they're not gods. I'm not really sure I understand what Lan's comment is. I wouldn't have thought that Alana needs a, a reminder of that. I guess that's a fine conversation. But either way, um, then Yvonne uh, uh, says, Wow, well, she knows we want the same thing as her. What's that? The triumph of the light over the dark and desert after. I like this. I like this conversation. I think it's very good. And then Yvonne asks, what does Moraine want? And I do think this could have been done a little bit more subtly, but it wasn't all that bad. Either way, to me, it looked like now he's prying. And I actually thought that Lan was going to like resist telling him but it seems like it went over Lan's head. Like Lan, who is always so protective, especially of the secrets between himself and Moraine and their mission. Like he knows how important what they're doing actually is. So I just felt like it wouldn't have gone over his head that this is somebody who is trying to find out what Moraine is up to. But anyway, so he goes, so what about Moraine? What does she want? And Lan just kind of sighs and goes, I think that's the problem. I don't think I actually know what she wants anymore. And then we go over to Alana and Maxim, who, while these two have been chit-chatting under the olive trees, uh, they have snuck into Lan's room and gone into his uh, saddlebag. I guess Maxim must have 
poked around himself and seen something that disturbed him. And now he's showing it to Alana. And it's that letter, it's the, or not the letter, the uh, poem. Everybody who has read this letter finds it very disturbing. And Alana is like very troubled by it. And she looks like she's super worried, like not knowing maybe what to do, but also like, oh my gosh, I think I know what we have to do, but I can't believe we have to do this sort of an expression. This is good. This is I, Now there's tension. We feel like something is going to happen here. This is all good stuff. It's just too bad that I... <laughs> I, I didn't like any of the buildup up to this. And maybe it's just personal, but no, 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 it's not. There's too much stuff that has been self-contradictory and not explained so that that way there can be this mystery, but it's a very contrived mystery because literally the only reason it's a mystery is because you're going out of your way not to explain things and nothing's clear. So whatever. Anyway, but within its own context, this little storyline between Lan and the warders and Alana is okay, even though Alana is clearly evil. Then we get Yvonne showing up in the middle of the night. Uh, Alana and Maxim have been waiting for him out in the garden area. And she's like, are you sure he's asleep? I'm like, well, yes, I, I snuck away from Lan. <laughs> are you serious? But they have the poem. They have the poem. Land didn't notice it missing. Like, they didn't think that would be an issue. Like, he wouldn't have checked that it was still there. Okay, whatever. Anyway, that's a little convenient. But um, they go, what What did you find? And he says, it's a prophecy written in the old tongue. Land must not know what it says. Mm hmm huh? How could he not know? I'm, I'm confused about this. I feel like, as far as understanding the old tongue, this is something that Land would know since he... Actually, no... That they've already proved this is something he should know because he understands the old tongue. He's able to translate Nynaeve's words when she didn't know what they meant, but he did because it's in the old tongue. Is there a dot I'm not connecting? Uh -uh. How would they assume he doesn't know what it means? I, okay, maybe they don't think he knows, but he does. I. Patience. Patience, my love. Anyway, they, they reveal for the audience's sake what it's about. It says that it's a prophecy. It's about land fear. And it basically says that she's back in our world. And apparently she's going to, the, this is what's revealed in the prophecy, is that she's going to kill somebody uh, in order to make him serve her. Let me see if I can read it again. She walks again, the ancient war she yet fights. Her new lover she seeks, who shall serve her and die, yet serve still. Who shall stand against her coming? The shining walls shall kneel. Blood feeds blood, blood calls blood. Blood is blood, was, and blood shall ever be. And of course, we're watching Rand and Celine about to bang, so we know exactly who it's about. I mean, th this is not ba badly written. It's, it's not, but it's like the setup for it was bad. Why would they assume Lan cannot understand the old tongue? Is this like a secret that he's kept from everybody? If so, why would he reveal it to Nynaeve? I don't know, whatever. That's the end of that. Okay, just because I feel like getting into a different person's story, we're going to Matt now. Um, so Matt and Min are in a pub and they're playing dice and Matt is losing. They talk about her power as if to remind us of it again. Now, you said you could only see people's features. Boring. We already knew that. Why don't you get us a run? I am tired. I can't move. I've heard that before. All I want to do is have sex. Sex, sex, and more sex. How about I'll get us another round in rooms? So, tell me exactly what you mean by sex. You know, the sex. Holding hands, eating ice cream. Oh. She goes off to the bar, and the barman and her exchange a look like they both knew that each other were going to be there. So this is the place that Leandrin wanted uh, men to take Matt. I'm, I'm still not clear on what the reason for this is, but okay, oh. so she's like, oh. well... She, she tells the barman, um, oh. I, I, I'm going to get him drunk. So she's paid for a bunch of extra drinks. So she wants them to keep coming. She's like, uh, uh, after he's drunk, I want a, a, a room. He's like, but I want the attic. She wants the attic specifically. She says, somebody's going to show up here asking for the attic as well. Just show him the way. I'm like, take them there or whatever. Um, and that's pretty much the end of it. So we know that this was what the plan was. I, I'm just bored with Matt and... 
and men, I honestly don't care who they're meeting up with. This is the consequence of not creating likable characters. I don't particularly care for Matt. Min is a bad guy. I'm not really getting behind any conflict that she might be having. I mean, I haven't seen a whole lot of it. And yeah, so whatever. Okay. This is what's happening next, I guess. What is going on with my hair? From a writing perspective, it is supposed to be creating that that question of who are they going to meet? Like who who is it that Leandrin wanted Min to bring Matt to? And then my question is, why didn't Leandrin just bring Matt? I don't know, whatever, doesn't matter. In the next scene, we are in Min's perspective. She's having a nightmare, obviously, about her past. She's woken up in the night by her auntie who sits her down and says like, you know, there's customers waiting. She's like, no, I escaped you guys. And they go, you of all people know that nobody can escape their past. So apparently her auntie had been forcing her to be a fortune teller for people. So people were coming before her and asking like, what's gonna happen to me? Like. And she was seeing their fate. Like there was one where a kid was asking like, what am I gonna be when I grow older or something like that? And she could see that he dies young. And there was a woman who she was asking if she's going to be happy in her marriage. And it looks like she has some sort of a disease. So I, either way. And then Ishamael appears in her vision. And it's obvious that this is not real. This is one, of, this is, or this isn't just a normal dream. This is like the dream world, which is a thing in the books. and. The idea of the dream world is, is that it is actually a real place and there are consequences in this dream world. It's not, I, it's not clear to me, having only finished the first three books, if what we saw in the arches and what we saw in that weird, like between the worlds, world, you know, a possible world thing, you know, when, when Rand went through the, um, the portal stone or whatever, I don't think it's the same. I think it's its own thing but it hasn't been defined yet, at least I haven't figured that out, at least if it is a different thing. Um, but the dream world is like a real place. Everybody can kind of get there if they have this power, if they can, anyway, not clear there either. <laughs> We're not inside your head, man. We don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> they, they can get into this dream world and uh, the things that happen there are can be real. Like you can have conversations with other people, even if they're on the other side of the world. Um, you can acquire knowledge about things that you that you're trying to find out in the real world but can't for some reason. So anyway, it, it, the main thing is this is that when she has this vision of or this dream and then suddenly Ishamael appears and it, we know that this is actually Ishamael and he is having this conversation with her like this is them having a discussion even if Ishamael is, on the other side of the world, he's able to have, it's basically a Zoom call right now happening in her head. So Ishamael basically reveals to her that he is a Forsaken. And she's like, what? I had no idea that we were dealing with a Forsaken. And uh, he reveals that the deal between Min and Leandrin was that Leandrin promised Min that she could take away her visions. Now, this was not hinted at or built up to at all. So the previous scene where we saw Min and Leandrin talking in the kitchen, you know, in the previous episode, Leandrin implied that there was something that Moraine had over Min and that this was the way that they were going to get past this. And that is, I mean, could you imagine Somebody saying like, I can give you something that you want. I can take away, I know somebody who can take away your power, right? Your your ability to see the future or whatever. And the way that you talk about it is how another person holds something over you. I guess if you really, really dig into it, you could, you could say that, you know, I mean, is it possible that you could get to that is where this conversation goes? But this does not... I just, this is not properly built up to. The way their conversation went before implies that Min has a threat against her, that Moraine is threatening her, that Leandrin even is threatening her. And this is, I've got something I can give to you. And none of that was was hinted at before this. And I know, like I said, I can see how you can get it there 
It's just that the tone of their conversation before was that Min was being bribed to do this. Not that this was something she wanted to do. And maybe you can say like, oh, maybe it's something she doesn't want. Well, what about this dream that she just had? It looks like her night, her visions are nothing but hell for her. So why wouldn't she be like, yes, like I will do this thing if you promise you'll do what you promised. Like that, she should have been more enthusiastic about this before. That would have implied that, and then it, don't even bother saying like, Moraine won't have anything over you. Don't even bother saying that. Like, I will be able to help you with your problem if you can do this. And that would have been how you should have built up to this. Instead, it was as if there were two separate people writing this and they both had different ideas of how the other conversations were going to go. And they didn't go the way that they thought. And so now they just don't fit together. So that's all I got to say on this. Oh my gosh, I have to stop getting frustrated. I need to just kick back and relax and just be like, whatever. I'm just not enjoying this. <laughs> I wish I could say I'm enjoying it. I'm just not. And it's mainly because I just don't care about any of the characters. I just don't. I don't care about them. I came into the Wheel of Time, the show, not knowing that it was so poorly received by so many of the book fans. I thought, surely, because I had heard from Amazon mainly that it was great, that it was a hit. And so I thought, oh, it's probably going to have like a lot of good stuff in it that I'll enjoy, but also some stuff that I can, you know, point out this would have been better, just like how I did with Shadow and Bone. But that's not what I got. And now I'm just tired. I'm just tired of this show. I'm not tired of the books. I, I'm enjoying the books immensely. I don't know how you could screw up taking something that is at the at its worst entertaining. It's just, you know, uh, the, that that is the worst that it is. At its best, it's got some really cool stuff in it. I, I I just have to move on. Just have to move on. Need to breathe. I need a drink. Okay. So then um, Min at least says, I'm I'm not helping you with nothing. I'm not going to help you hurt Matt. And he's like, well, you might. And he's like, you know, you, it's, 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 I can't even bother to go back and double check exactly what he said. But basically he's like, don't you want me to take away your curse from you? And he's like, if you want me to do that, well, you you came here to get instructions on where to take Matt next. And well, I'm telling you, you need to take him to Kyrian, which is the town that Rand has been staying in. So this is again, like, okay. And it, oh, it doesn't matter. Just some, oh, don't care. Okay. So she asks what's in Kyrian, which is the hint that she is going to bring him there. And at this point, I'm still going, what the hell is Ishamael's plan? Why would he bring one of the Taveran to be near Rand when we find out at the end of season two, it's not necessarily Ishamael's plan to kill Rand? Because remember, when Min looked at Matt, she saw that Matt stabs Rand, right? It's like, okay, I guess that's what the plan is. I'm going to bring Matt to where the dragon is so that Matt can kill the dragon. But ultimately, that's not what Ishamael wants. I'm still not seeing how the mathematics of his scheme comes out to, I'm going to get Rand to obliterate me so I'm no longer in the wheel, like whatever. That's what his ultimate plan was. I hate this place. <sighs> There's just no urgency. Even if his plan was like, oh, this is my backup plan. If he doesn't do, if Rand doesn't do what I want him to do, then I'm going to get, um, Matt to kill him, and then in his next iteration of life, the dragon's next life, that's when I will try again to convince him to, you know, eliminate all of humanity. Like, then what's the urgency? That nothing urgent. Oh my gosh. The reason that they're doing this, though, I can see it's because Matt was supposed to be with everybody at this point, supposed to be with Rand and Perrin and the gang hunting down the horn, but he's not there. So they gotta figure out how to get Matt over to where Rand is. Really the only way to have fixed this would have been for Amazon to recast a new Matt immediately after they lost the old one. And I don't think it would have been that hard to do. I don't care what you think. Amazon is one of the biggest companies in the world. They have all the money in the world. They easily could have found somebody to step in as Matt to film the last couple, what was it, one or two episodes, the last two episodes, they could have done it. There was no reason to not have it. I mean, Matt's whole story up until now has been a disaster. And Min is being destroyed as a character here. She is not like this. She is 
doing everything in her power to be supportive of Rand at this point. Like she is helping Rand. Like at, at the end of book two, she basically rushes to Rand's side and is there to help him and support him. And even Egwene is like kind of jealous because she picks up on that Rand and Min are supposed to be together in some way. And it's like, oh, I just don't see how that could happen. I really cannot see at all how Min is going to end up with Rand because that's what, that is how their relationship starts in, honestly, I can't remember now if it was the end of the Great Hunt or the beginning of the Dragon Reborn. I think it was at the end of the Great Hunt because the beginning of the Dragon Reborn, they're in that camp. But you see what I mean? Min's role in Rand's life is very important. They are supposed to be together. She feels a romantic urge to be at his side. And she knows that that's like kind of the tool that is being used to keep her close to him physically, because maybe she isn't supposed to be with him romantically, but she's supposed to be near him so that as a Taverin, as some, or maybe I don't even know if she's a Taverin, but as somebody who can see the future and see these things, she's supposed to be near him. She's aware of it. She doesn't like it, but she's just going with it because that she's like, that's just the way it has to be. And I just don't see how she's going to end up with Rand. I don't see how that is going to happen at all. I have no idea. It, it's just going to feel forced. And again, I, I foresee a future love triangle drama between Rand and Matt and Min. Oh, I love love stories, don't you? Lovely, sad story. Oh, that's a terrible story. Yeah. So dumb. Okay, anyway, there's nothing between Matt and Min so far in the books. I'm only three books in, but there hasn't been even the slightest hint of anything between them, so... It would be an interesting pairing, though, because his ability it has to do with luck random things not feeling so random. So like when he throws dice, they always uh, land in his favor. So he's able to get a bunch of money when he needs it. If he randomly walks into any old room and he's looking for somebody, like that's where they'll be. Like th yeah, that's the level of luck that he has. And she can see the definite future, the future that will happen. Unless she sees one and she doesn't understand it. If she doesn't understand it, it doesn't happen apparently. Which seems like kind of a wishy-washiness in the rules, but whatever. Anyway, let's move on. I don't care about thinking about this that much. <laughs> Moving on to Perrin. So Perrin is with Elias and they have escaped the caravan. Perrin saying like, hey, it's been hours. Like we, we need to go back and find my friends. So are you sure we're even going the right way? And Elias is like, wolves don't get lost. And Perrin goes, you're the one leading us, not the wolves. And that is when Elias basically looks at Perrin, you know, confronting him with the truth and says like, look at me, boy, I am them, they are me. And then he basically says like, we're the same. I'm a wolf, you hear? And Perrin goes, what are we? And Elias explains, wolf brother, they call us. I mean, this should have happened in season one, but okay. He explains that, well, he doesn't really explain. He's being all evasive with what everything is. Perrin says, are they all war wolf brothers? And asking about the wolves, like, are they, he's asked, sorry, am I gonna turn into a wolf at some point? Now, this is a major point of, of conflict and, and fear for Perrin through a lot of book two and especially three. Like he's afraid he is going to essentially go mad, turn into a wild animal kind of guy, or possibly in this case, turn into a wolf. And it's something that that comes after him learning about all of this stuff. I would have really liked to have seen Perrin really struggling with his wolfiness more. Instead, it seems like he's been kind of ignoring it up until now. And I feel like it was a missed opportunity to have Perrin struggling with his sort of wolf brother urges. But anyway, um, the, we will get into that more when it becomes more relevant later. Then Perrin asks, how did you find me? And, and this is just a convenience, setting this line in here at this particular moment so you could have this next thing happen. I mean, it's obvious how Elias found Perrin. It was a freaking caravan. Like he, he it was so hard to notice a caravan going by, oh, okay. Anyway, but he said this so that at that particular moment, this apparition of a an elk, a glowing elk floating in the air could trot by and Elias could explain. It's our language. One of our scouts spotted a buck. Send that vision to lead us to it. Okay, so in the books, 
um, what would happen is Perrin would actually kind of see through the eyes of a particular wolf if it wanted to get information to him and he would know what their thoughts are and their feelings are. And that's kind of a tough thing to show, but I feel like this wasn't exactly the best way to show it. Okay, so what Elias said, I am them and they are me, that is very accurate to what it is in the book. I mean, you kind of get this blending of minds because they're able to go into each other's mm. minds. This does not do that. You do not see Perrin suddenly seeing through the eyes of one of the wolves. It's literally one of them sends a telegram to him and that's that's not the same connection i'm i don't see a problem with this if it doesn't interfere with anything further down the line but because it's so different from what is set up in the books like again i've only read the first three so i don't know what's coming further down the line of the story but this seems so very different. The connection between Perrin and the Wolf Brothers seems so different from what it is in the books. I'm wondering if there's gonna be consequences for having this change. Like Perrin should feel like he can go into the minds of the wolves and that the wolves can go into his mind. And that's so different from, I can send an apparition of an elk to you, know, to, you to guide you to where I am. That's just different. Um, and yeah, I see problems with that. Whatever, I guess that's really all I have to say on this. I do wanna comment on um, on seeing all of these trained uh, wolf dogs and wolves. I think they're very nice. I think it, I love uh, using practical effects. I'm so glad that they didn't have CGI wolves or something. This is nice and, and they're very nicely kept animals. So I'm happy. I, I just like seeing the the pretty dogs, so. But yeah, so Perrin asks, how does it work? Like he sees this apparition go and he learns about what it is. He's like, but how does it work? How do you know all this stuff? And Elias says, it's instinct. Like you will just instinctively know how to send one of these and understand what it means. And I, I just would have liked maybe a little more of an explanation, but at, again, I mean, because this is different from what it is in the books, who knows where they're gonna go with this. Uh, but Perrin says, did you know that the Sean Chan were going to attack the village. Is that why you didn't stay in the village with us that night? Um, did they warn you and you didn't say anything to us? Like, I don't understand why he wouldn't have warned everybody. To me, I did get the impression that he feels separate from everybody else and doesn't want to be part of everybody else, but he would have tried to protect Perrin at least. And to allow the Sean Chan to attack without warning anybody implies that he was okay with Perrin getting killed. So in the next scene, they are at the kill, uh, the killed buck. This is not what a buck looks like when its guts have been pulled out of it. I mean, it's like the rib whole cage, half of it was outside of the body, but the rest of it was intact, weird, whatever. Anyway, I'm not gonna complain too much about that, just mentioning it. Um, so the wolves are eating the buck and Elias is partaking in the meat and you can see Perrin kind of grossed out that Elias is eating raw meat and he's cooking his. And Elias is like, you're gonna lose your your taste for for cooked flesh soon enough. Like you'll you'll want it raw at some point. There's one particular wolf that is sitting next to uh, Perrin and <laughs> looks over at him. It's very cute. This is fun, cute little doggy behaviors that Sorsha I have seen do as well. Um, <laughs> it's kind of goofy when they do it. But uh, Perrin asks, what's this one's name? And Elias is like, oh, he'll show you when he's ready for you to know or whatever. And then he says, we've been. He likes you though. We've been. We've been watching you for a long time. And he says, you know, it's a good thing that we were there to help you and that girl escape from the White Cloaks. And this is where it registers to Perrin that they've been following him in particular. Like, so all that wolf chasing through the, uh, through the forest, supposedly Elias was there with them. We've had our eye on you for a long time. You're lucky we were there to save you and that girl from the White Cloaks. That was you? Huh. You've been sending us images for months now. Well, it would have been really nice if at this point we saw Perrin having some weird wolf visions or something. We had him encountering wolves, right? And hearing them when they were chasing him or whatever, but we never saw anything sort of magical going on between Perrin and the wolves, with the exception of his eyes turning yellow that one time. Like, it would have been really nice if we had hints of something magical happening to Perrin, and that just didn't happen. So to me, this was not very well built up to. It's like they they started having him, you know, be liked by wolves in the first season, and then having a moment where his eyes turned yellow suddenly, and wolves were there, but 
this implies that it wasn't that the wolves were drawn to him, it's that he drew them to him. And we didn't have any hints of that, that he was drawing them. Would have just been nice. Is it the worst thing ever? No, but it would have been better, I think, if there was something to indicate a magical thing happening. So Elias reveals that uh, the little wolf that's near him has lost his mate too and still mourns for her. So that, that's why this particular wolf is connecting with Perrin. I actually don't remember if that was why this particular wolf was connecting. Actually, no, that, that didn't happen. That, that was a nothing. That was a nothing in the books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joshing you, guy. Sorry, I, I crack a lot of jokes because I'm in such a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but... Uh, Perrin looks at Elias like, how'd you know about this? And Elias is like, every time that you sleep, you we dream about her. Like, so we've all seen her. We know what's going on or what we know what happened. And Perrin asks, why didn't you come to me sooner then? If you've been following me for months, why'd you wait all this time? Now, remember, this would have been like over half a year. So not just a few months. And I don't know when it was supposed to be that... Egwene and uh, Perrin were running from the wolves in the forest right before they met up with the Tawatha on, but this is sort of implying that it happened then. I don't know how, how long was the journey? Oh, it doesn't matter, I don't care, I don't care. Okay. Why did you wait so long to come to me? If you've been following me for months. We don't go near women who can channel. I said I don't trust what they don't understand. And that was not a problem in the books because Elias was right there with Perrin and Egwene and I don't know, like, how did he know that Egwene could channel? I don't know. I'm kind of psychic. It's like I have ESPN or something. Anyway, um, so yeah, that was that. And then suddenly, Hopper reveals his name by creating an apparition of himself hopping, which it's fine, I guess. I, I would have liked that perhaps something happened in that moment that created a stronger connection between Perrin and Hopper. Like, I don't know, maybe maybe Perrin noticed a piece of raw meat that, or he had some raw meat that didn't make it onto his stick. Like he had more that he wanted to cook and he decided to offer it to Hopper, maybe out of like, you know, I'm sorry that you're, you're lonely too because your mate has died and given it to the Hopper. And then at that moment would have been when Hopper reveals his name, but uh, that's not what they did. They just had him suddenly decide, okay, now is the time for me to reveal the name. Why now instead of before? Well, because we had to create the mystery, which is what is this one called? And like, well, he'll reveal his name when he's ready. And then we can have some more conversation while we're waiting to find that information out. And then at the end of it, we've gotten all of our other conversation out of the way. Now Hopper reveals his name is Hopper and it's his big magical thing. I don't know. Just could have been done a little bit better. Wasn't bad. Wasn't, again, again, not the worst thing ever. Not totally terrible. Just could have, could have done something to like, why this moment did Hopper feel like, ah, I'm ready now to tell you more about myself and like what my name is. And that would have been like, we suddenly feel more connected. So seeing that Perrin maybe has some compassion for this dog that has also lost its mate. And that is all we get of Perrin in this instance. Now, there was one major thing lacking in this scene, and that was a continuation of the urgency of Perrin to get back and help his friends. As far as he knows, the Shinaran soldiers are still imprisoned by the Shan Chan. So he should be constantly like, we need to go and, and help them and get them. But it's like, as soon as Elias revealed this thing about the wolves, he completely forgot that that was a concern. I, we should have seen him maybe at the end of this saying, when are we gonna get back on the road or something? I don't know, I I just felt like they, they took us away from the urgency of where they're trying to get to. Like I forgot at this point that the, the, the Shinarans are still out there and that Perrin should be wanting to go and rescue them. Like I forgot that that's a thing. Why you want to leave me? It ended on such a note that it's like, ah, oh, isn't it like we're having a good barbecue here? Isn't this nice? Like you you want to try to keep up the urgency of you need to go somewhere. Like the, the only reason you would end this scene like this is if you had plans for another one in this episode to continue the, we need to get a hold of the Sean, get to the Sean Chan, or maybe have Perrin thinking to himself, show some, have some way for Perrin to be like, maybe with all of the wolves, we'll be able to rescue them or something. I don't know. I really, there's a million things you could do, but I forgot that 
they they should be wanting to go and save the other the other Shinarans. Okay, we're moving on to Nynaeve, Egwene, and Leandrin, and, and I guess, um, what's her name? Elaine. I'm just going to group them all together if I can. But uh, okay, so Nynaeve wakes up, or gets out of bed anyway. She's been dreaming about or thinking about, you know, what happened to her in the arches. She goes to answer the door, but quickly puts her uh, accepted ring on, and it's Egwene. Egwene is like, I brought you some honey cakes. And she goes, did you get any sleep? And she's like, I didn't sleep at all. And she's like, yeah, I suppose I wouldn't have slept either. So I'm guessing this is supposed to be literally the very next day. Like, the Nynaeve came out of the arches, distraught that she's lost her family, and this is the very next morning, I guess, because that was in the middle of the night. I, I don't know why, but I sort of had it in my head that possibly more time has gone by, but... <sighs> Okay, it's the very next day. It happened so fast. But Egwene uh, embraces her and says, I'm so glad to have you back and uh, it's going to be okay. None of it was real. None of it was real. I don't know if this was supposed to be informing the audience that that is what we're supposed to believe, that none of it was real and that it just felt real. But... It, again, would be nice to have some clarification in what the show is trying to tell us because in the books, well, actually it happens in the second book. Is, doesn't it happen in the second book? Yeah. It's very explicit. They don't know if it's real or not real. And so everything that Nynaeve experienced might actually have been real. She might have been in her own body in a different, like a parallel world where she had all of these things, which means that she really did leave the two rivers in a dire situation. She really did basically watch her whole family get killed. And she, you know, we assume that she had a lifetime there, but anyway, nothing wrong with how this scene is being done. Um, just that I wish that there was that clarification. Okay, but then in the next scene, we've got Egwene and Elaine mopping the floor and they're mopping it wrong. Like this is not how you mop. They are mopping ahead of where they're stepping. So they're creating footprints in the, uh, anyway. I've never worked a day in my life. Oh, that's not what's, <laughs> that's poor directing. But um, what they're saying is something's different between us since she came back. She's an accepted now. It's not that. Maybe a little bit. But no matter how much I want to help, I can't seem to say or do the right thing. And stop trying. The only thing is, is we've, the previous scene kind of implied that this is the very next morning. So she's talking as if she's been trying to help her for days now and nothing seems to be helping. But the very line that Egwene said to uh, Nynaeve was, how did you sleep last night? And she goes, I didn't at all. And she goes, well, I, yeah, I don't think I would have been able to either. Is that what you would say to somebody five nights later? I mean, no, this is what you would say the very next day. Like, yeah, what happened last night was pretty traumatic. So I wouldn't have been able to sleep either. So it's, it's just very heavily implied that this is the next day. But now this conversation seems to be implying that they've had lots of instances where Egwene has been trying to cheer up Nynaeve and like be there for her, support her, do something, get something from her. But she feels like she's having no effect on Nynaeve at all. Why do you feel like you have to fix it? Because I'm her friend. She was there for me last year when I lost someone I love more than anything. And I only got through it because I had her to hold me up, even though she was hurting too. I should be the same for her. This is all nice. I like this. Just wish it all made sense. Then you've got Egwene. <sighs> this is, okay. So she starts complaining that I should be able to be the one who's there for Nynaeve. But, you know, I used to be. I, I wish we had seen her being this person for Nynaeve in the past, but we didn't. So they're telling us that she has been in the past, even though we've seen no evidence of that. Anyway, she says, but ever since I've come to this tower, I just feel smaller and smaller. Like, so she's implying that being here has diminished me in some way. I mean, this is again, her feeling jealous, not jealous, although it could be, it all stems from the jealousy, but her feeling like everybody around me is better at stuff than me. And I just feel small. Like I, I can't excel here because everybody's so much better than me. It seems to be that she's forgotten that she now knows how to channel quite well. In fact, she's able to channel a wall of fire to appear only in a doorway on the other side of a person standing in front of her. Next, we get Nynaeve walking through the tower. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Yep. She goes over to the wards, 
practice ring and she's looking for Yvonne and Maxim, but they're not there. And one of the other warders is like, oh, they look, they took off with uh, Alana Sedai, but I'll train with you if you want. And um, then she's like, oh no, it's okay. And then he kind of stops her from leaving and goes, hey, is it true that you channeled in the arches? This is the first time we're hearing that that's like an exceptional thing. I guess it's the first opportunity that we've had to hear that. It's just weird that a warder is saying it. I, I feel like this would have been outside of their conversation. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, and he goes, I'm surprised that the uh, the other Ajas are not following you around, like, you know, trying to convince you to join them. And he's like, "What? I know it's a little ways before you choose, but, you know, I just hope it isn't red. Uh, okay, and it just so happens that Leandrin is there at that moment. She overhears all of this, and she's pleased when she sees that Nynaeve walks away from this. Then right at that moment, Leandrin gets a message and she seems upset about it. So she goes to Leanne and Leanne is in, I be, it looks like the Amerlin seats offices or whatever. Oh, I get it. When the cat's away. And um, she's like, hey, I heard, I just got a message that there's been an attack on the Western shores and we're not doing anything about it. Leanne is like, there's always attacks happening on the Western shore and it's usually them attacking themselves. But don't worry, we've sent... We've sent ladies off there to go and investigate. When did they last send a report? Is the Amelin aware? Of course. When did you last speak with her? The Keeper rules the tower when the Amelin is away, so I speak with the Amelin every time I open my mouth. Oh. Did you get that, Captain? Not a word. People would notice this and it wouldn't seem clever, it would seem evasive. And so I don't see this as clever dialogue at all, I just see this as convoluted. But at the end of this, Leandrin goes, You know, if she falls, implying the Amarillin seat, if the Amarillin seat falls, you'll fall with her. And then she skedaddles off and Leanne is left there going like, I can't believe she would just say that. I don't really see how people could be this aggressive. I mean, this is a threat, essentially. Leandrin is leading a rebellion psychologically against the Amarillin seat. And the Amarillin seat put on that show to like excommunicate uh, Moraine for somehow it being implied that she felt herself above the Amarillin seat. Why is she not going after Leandrin? Makes no sense. This makes no sense at all. There's no consistency anyway. Then we've got Leandrin finds Nynaeve in the room with the arches and she's just sitting there looking at the arches and Nynaeve asks, was any of it real? And Leandrin sits down and goes, the pain. And, you know, eventually that goes away. So Leandrin has just said that what happens in the arches is not real. That's what she has said. The only thing that was real was the pain and the pain goes away eventually. And that is like the confirmation that depletes the value of what happened in the arches. In the books, they don't know if it's real, they don't know if it's not, as I explained earlier in this video. So she may have made some real sacrifices, may have really abandoned real people that she loved. And that now it's just like, it was all a dream. It just takes that value away. Oh, I have to stop caring so much about this not doing things as well as the book has done because oh, it's hard to ignore, but <sighs> okay, moving on. Now we're having Leandrin bond with Nynaeve over this sacrifice of her child. So uh, remember the last time that Nynaeve and Leandrin spoke to each other was right before she went in the arches and Nynaeve said, I regret nominating you to go through the arches. Like she regretted that because she's like, if, if I hadn't done that already, I wouldn't have done it because she was pissed off at Nynaeve for following her and discovering her secret. Yeah! But now she's using this as a tool to bond them. And I see this as being like, this is the reason, I think, this is the reason why the writers decided to have Leandrin have a child secretly, have a son uh, in the city, because they wanted this bond after this experience to be stronger. And this is fine. This is actually, they, this is a way to do it right. It doesn't happen in the book, so I don't know what it's going to destroy later on, but it does create an opportunity for a stronger bond here. However... I am still wondering like, okay, so because Nynaeve has come back from the dead, never mind. I was gonna complain about how Leandrin is so easily forgiving Nynaeve in order to create this bond, but I don't know. <sighs> Should I think this through and try to reason out how Leandrin's son is just kind of like a tool 
oh, I don't care. I don't care. I don't want to think about this anymore. Let's just move on. This is done well. This is actually good, good setup. Like this is how you create the bond between the two of them. It is unfortunate that we already know that Leandrin is evil, so. But Leandrin asks her, who did you leave behind in there? And uh, Nynaeve is like, my, my daughter. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to just forget her and everything that happened in there. I was in there for years and it's fading, but I, I still remember it. I've kept my son a secret for 80 years now, 90. I told myself it was for his own protection. Stop my enemies from hurting him to get to me. The three oaths bind us to speak the truth to others, not ourselves. I could have hidden him anywhere. Probably a thousand safer places, but I kept him here in Tarvalon. I kept him here for me. Because I was afraid. I couldn't risk losing the only thing in this world that's ever been truly mine. This is very self-aware of Leandrin, and also very honest of Leandrin, to be saying this to Nynaeve. After her last encounter with her, she was so defensive, so furious of somebody discovering her secret. It's um, it's a major turnaround. Like, this is a massive change in this character. But, I mean, this is, this does actually work. I just, it's a little bit sudden, but it does actually work. The only complaint that I can think of for this is that uh, if Leandrin is supposed to be just pure evil, this is humanizing her a lot. This is creating a very sympathetic character. And it's not as if the books haven't done that. So at the end of The Great Hunt, Ingtar uh, reveals that he was, well, evil, but he was a character in great conflict. And uh, in many, many past lives, he's always done the wrong thing, the bad thing, the selfish thing. He's always been the traitor. But in his current iteration, he decides, I'm going to put an end to that cycle and I'm going to do the right thing. And he does. He self-sacrifices for the sake of being a better person. Um, so this isn't outside of the scope of what characters can do. But I have no idea what the plan is for Nynaeve going forward. Like, I don't know what her deal is. So... If she's supposed to be pure evil at the end, now we're going to have to see her descend into that. It's not bad to have conflict in how we feel about a bad guy, but I don't know where this goes with her character. So far, she's been playing a much bigger role in the show than she was in the book. So I don't know what's going to happen. And I do, I would be like warning writers, like, make sure what you're doing doesn't affect things much further down the road or isn't going to make things further down the road really hard to do because you've created a likable character here. I like Leandrin in the show. She's a good guy. I mean, well, she's a bad guy, but <laughs> I I get her and I like how she does things. Like this is a good villain, secret villain, but I don't know where this goes further down in this story. Caution. That's, that's what the word is I'm looking for. Yeah, I would caution the writers about this. Leandrin says that men are cursed, they go mad and kill the ones that they love when they use the one power. And he's like, but the Aes Sedai, we women, we're cursed also because channeling slows down the aging process. So we live for a really long time and we have to watch the people that we love die anyway from old age. And there's nothing that we can do to stop it. And Nynaeve is like, I can see why they don't let you teach novices. Well, I, I feel like I would have, uh, I'm not going to complain anymore. This is actually probably my my favorite scene in this episode so far is seeing Leandrin connecting with Nynaeve in a very believable, make sense kind of way. So Nynaeve says, I'm going to tell you basically how to get by. This is her, remember all the, the warders telling Nynaeve that you have to find something that is, you know, for yourself alone and that's what's going to get you through, you know, becoming an Aes Sedai. Well, now Leandrin gives probably the most realistic advice, which is, you find a piece of this world that belongs to you, and you hold on to it. And then, when it's finally gone, you, you find another. Have you found another? I don't know if they were trying to imply that Nynaeve has found either the Dark One or has found a way around it. Like, maybe she thinks that by joining the Dark One, she'll be able to keep her son alive somehow. Um, or if she's implying naive, but she doesn't answer the question. She just immediately moves the, she, she diverts the subject of discussion. What she does is she tells Nynaeve about the report that she has heard. She says that there's been attack on the Western shores and they, nobody cares because they haven't really captured a whole lot of our people, but 
they did get, there was one report of an unusual capture. They captured a group of Shinaran soldiers who were far from home and they were traveling with an Ogier and a blacksmith from the two rivers. I know those guys! And of course, we'll learn later on that she's telling this to Nynaeve because she wants Nynaeve and Egwene and all of them to, to leave the tower, to sneak out of the tower so she can get them out of it. Anyway, but I like this. This is good. This is all fine. This is good. This is the best writing in the episode so far is... I, at this point, like, I wouldn't give a shit about Moraine or even Perrin or Matt or any of those guys. Like, this is the most interesting storyline in this episode. I need something more. I know you all have your messy love lives and your secrets and your silliness, but I want more. I need something to hold on to. Then we get Egwene and Elaine drinking, and um, Egwene is like, oh, I'm jealous that you know exactly what you're going to do in life, you know, becoming the queen. And Elaine is like, I believe it or not, I've always wished that I could have a choice as to what I get to do. And uh, they have a laugh, and Egwene goes, you want to trade? And Elaine's like, no. <laughs> I like that. It was cute. But then this next bit of conversation, well, first of all, Nynaeve makes herself just as unlikable again. Oh, okay. So Nynaeve comes in, and says, I've been looking for you everywhere. You didn't look in Egwene's best friend's room. Like, okay, anyway. Give us a moment. This is my room. And my glass I need to wash. So you gave up? Perrin and Loyal have been captured. I'm going to farm to free them. Farm? That's on the other side of the world. I just came to tell you that I'm leaving. You don't have to come. I'm an accepted. I can leave the tower whenever I want, but if they catch you, I'll expel you. You think I care about that? I mean, if our friends are in trouble, why would you think I'd ever stay here? It seems like Nynaeve is just standing there waiting for Egwene to explain why she wants to go. Like, I kind of expected, just from the way it was shot, that Nynaeve was gonna be like, I thought you'd say that, let's go. But she doesn't, she just sits there. You don't get it at all, do you? Why I've tried so hard here. If I'd have been ready at the eye of the world, I could have fought alongside Rand. Maybe he would have made it back. I'm never gonna fail any of you like that ever again. I know a safe way out. For some reason, I didn't believe this. And I don't know if it's because were they supposed to have had this conversation before or is it because Egwene has been so seemingly self-centered up until this point that I didn't believe this? I don't know. There was something about this that wasn't quite believable. And I could sit here and try to think about it. As a matter of fact, if I had watched this sooner and taken these notes and then said it to my camera, I probably would know what it is. But I don't really care that much about these characters, so I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to try and understand why this didn't quite work for me, but I'm just going to say it didn't work. If you can think of why it possibly didn't work, let me know about it in the comments. Anyway, moving on. And the next scene, we see uh, Nynaeve and Egwene sneaking through the underground tunnels, which I'm pretty sure are the same ones that Nynaeve used to follow Leandrin out. They start talking about what the situation is. So they're going to fall. And uh, that's where the sh the Shinarans have been taken, and um, the they're going to come up with their plan on the way there because it's basically on the other side of the world, and that's when. Elaine exposes herself. So she had been following them. She's like, yes, I've been following you. And Nynaeve is like, keep your mouth shut and get out of here. And Elaine's like, or what? Okay. He heating up. What's he doing? He heating up. He heating up. He heating up. No. He heating up. No. He heating up. No. You can't even channel and Egwene would never hurt me. for wielding your brain and actually threatening somebody in a, well, it wasn't even a threat. It, yeah, it was kind of a threat. Basically like, what are you gonna do? I'm coming with you, what are you gonna do? Well, actually she didn't say she was coming with them, just that she didn't know, she wanted to understand why they were sneaking out of the tower. And then at that moment, Leandrin shows up. In her first move of likability at all, Nynaeve says to Leandrin, they're with me, I brought them. If there's anybody who's gonna be in trouble, blame me, not them. And Leandrin looks at Elaine and says, you are a complication that basically she wasn't expecting. And then she goes, and um, 
Nynaeve, I am sorry for this. And she blasts them with the one power and they all get knocked out. And so if you ever had any doubts as to whether Leandrin was a good guy or a bad guy, this would pretty much solidify in your head, like, okay, she's a bad guy. And that's it for them in this episode. I mean, I, I had no real serious problems with this. Not a whole lot happened, just people talking about how they were feeling and then getting information through Leandrin that something was going on and they have to leave. Leandrin was the driving force of plot in this storyline. And that makes her, to me, the most interesting person. So I'm really glad that they had Nynaeve, or not Nynaeve, Le Leandrin back to her old ways as she was a few episodes before. I like this character. I don't care about how accurate she is to Leandrin in the books at this point. I'm just starving for something in this show for me to cling on to. And unfortunately, as soon as they showed Lan pissing on a tree, I, I kind of lost it. I don't know how I'm ever going to look at him the same because why would you film that? Oh, why? Ugh. Anyway. Leandrin is the most interesting person so far. So now we're moving on to Rand. The first scene is Rand is helping to scoop out the ruins of the destroyed, burned down inn that he burned down. And uh, Lanfear, I mean, Celine, comes over and goes, oh, uh, don't do that. If you rebuild the inn, I won't be able to charge you rent anymore. And he's like, look, it's the least I can do. And she's like, ah, psh, it's not your fault that that happened. I mean, I just forgot to put out some candles, that's all. And then she goes, I've hired some men to rebuild all of this. And you know what? I'm gonna be able to get away for the first time in a long time. And I'm just going, you own an inn in the slums if she was so wealthy that she can afford to rebuild this thing right away, why wasn't she living in like a mansion somewhere else and she just happened to own this inn that somebody else ran for her? The circumstances are suspicious. Uh, whatever. But Rand asks, where are you gonna go? And she says, my family has a cabin out in the middle of nowhere, I guess. And she's like, I haven't been able to go there since taking over the inn. She goes, would you like to come with me? And he's like, sorry, I'm just not good company for anybody. I really should be alone. And she's like, well, with all the other tenants gone, I guess you'll have the whole place to yourself. And she's like, if you really do wanna be alone, I guess that's fine. But you know, she she kind of leaves it at that. I mean, honestly, wh where was he gonna sleep? Uh, um, in, in some alley, I guess, I don't know. But <laughs> it's okay, this is not bad, this is fine. Doesn't happen in the book, but within the context of the show, it's fine. In the next scene, we see that they have left town. You, I think you can see it off in the distance on the other side of the river, but um, they're on this ridge looking out over a vast expanse. And I mean, the, the first thing that Rand says is this is incredible. And I'm just going, this is not, this has not come anywhere near the view that you used to have in the two rivers from your cabin or your little sightseeing spot. Whatever, okay, but then anyway, he his next line kind of confuses me a little bit. I just don't know what this means. He goes, Did your family build that cabin? Huh? Did your family build their cabin? Well, somebody built it. Did, what did he mean by that? Did they build it? Was it your family who built their cabin? Or did they purchase it from somebody? It would have been nice if that's what he meant for him to say that afterwards, because it's just an awkward question on its own. Did your family build their cabin? And Celine says, I was lying. Psych! I never used to come up here as a kid. I used to come with a man, the one before you. Well, you don't have to explain. We promise no past. Easy for you, since you're too young to have one. So at least they're acknowledging that there's a pretty big age difference between these two, that she looks at least 10 years older than him. He was the first man I ever loved. The only, actually. Powerful, confident, arrogant, really. With eyes that could fix everything in its place. Sounds a bit boring. Is he talking about himself? If he's talking, he's talking about himself. <laughs> And I keep thinking back, like, I know who this is, and by the end of the episode, we know who it is. This is the woman who was in love with Luz Theron. And the only time that we have seen Luz Theron up until now, he has not seemed like a arrogant person. So it doesn't quite match what I've got in my head from what we've seen in this show. He was not portrayed as being arrogant. Anyway, she gives us some actually interesting information in this instance. She says that, we used to get away together to come up here whenever we could, and we were always better when we were alone together, when we didn't have the world trying to pull us this way or that. 
And we used to joke about never coming back down again, but we always did. And she seems sad about that. And I don't know if the show is trying to imply that if the two of them had just stayed up in the mountains together, then all of the horrible things that happened in the world never would have happened. But I don't know. I, it, it is interesting to listen to this conversation knowing who she is and what she is talking about and wondering how much of this is true or not true. I get the feeling she's uh, telling us the truth, but I don't know because I haven't read that far in the books yet. Then we see what I think is so far in the show, the best instance of a demonstration of, of Celine, who we know is Lanfear, trying to, to steer Rand into becoming the powerful leader that she wants him to be. Because um, up until now, I just, I haven't really seen that. We haven't seen her suggesting that he do things or, or trying to show him why he should take things for himself. But so Rand says, I grew up somewhere like this. My friends, they used to dream of cities and traveling. But not me. Up here, well, it looks like it still fits together. I can't believe it's not broken. You want to go back there? The wheel never gives anyone what they want. Least of all me. No one and nothing ever gives you what you want. If you want something, you have to take it. In the book, there are so many times, the second book, when they are in this sort of world between the worlds, or it's like a parallel world, whatever, anyway. She is trying to encourage Rand to take charge of the group, to be the leader, to do the thing that the leader would do. And, and he kind of resists this. So this is the only difference between what happens in the book and what is happening here. Here she's suggesting similar things that she would in the book, which I'm so happy they're doing. I'm so glad that Celine is finally acting like Celine. And, but, it, but the thing I don't like about it is that Rand is seems to be symbolically by leaning down and kissing her. She's like offering him, don't you want this? Like, if you want it, you have to take it. And he takes it. He kisses her. So I didn't like that because it's, it seems to me that it's important that in the book, when he resists Celine, it's important that he always resisted her, that he didn't give in and do the things that she wanted. And here he's doing the thing that she wanted. Even though it's like, if you want something, take it yourself. And so he's like, I think I'm doing this because it's what I want. That's literally the whole method of temptation that she uses in this is that she's like, don't you want to be the one in charge? Like, don't you want, don't you think it's better if we did this thing? Like, and he would think to himself, she's right. It is better that we do this thing. And I should want to do that. But no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm not a Lord. And you, know, that's the mentality that we saw in Rand in the book. And I feel like it's really important that that's what we should be seeing here, but we're not seeing it. So even though I really liked all of this, when I compare it to what happened in the book, I go, I wonder if they should be doing that. I wonder if this is going to spoil something or ruin something later on in the story. So I would have warned the writers to be careful of making this change. But anyway, next we've got a scene that kind of confuses me. So apparently when Rand and Celine were on that, that ridge looking out over everything. They were right outside of her cabin, but they never showed the cabin. So I'm going, it, it, I was looking at this going like, I don't know what's happening. Is this a dream? Because here's what happens. It opens up with Rand and Celine. This next scene, it's night. They're asleep on the ground next to a bonfire. And Rand wakes up because he hears something and he looks off into the distance and sees there's a cabin right there. And I'm going, is this a dream? Like, did this cabin appear out of nowhere? This is poor directing. They should have shown, because later it's revealed this is not a dream. This is real. So for some reason, he and Celine have fallen asleep out on the ground, out uh, next to the bonfire instead of inside the cabin, even though the lights are on in the cabin and everything. Oh, whatever. Okay. They should have shown the cabin in the scene where they were on the ridge so that when they got to this part, we could maybe know immediately that this is not a dream and also be like, okay, I guess they were sitting out by the fire and fell asleep. They shouldn't also have been laying down on the ground. Maybe they should have been like leaning up against each other, having fallen asleep. So it looked like they were just out there enjoying the fire and fell asleep by it. Instead, it looks like they bedded down for the night in the dirt as opposed to inside the cabin, which would have been nice and cozy. I don't know why. Anyway, a fade attacks. And he picked up, Rand had picked up a, 
well, it looked like a stick, okay? But apparently this is his secret sheath for his sword. It was so hard to see. I mean, it's very dark. Everything's cut very quickly so you can't, and too close, so you never actually see anything. Like, they should have shown that there's this weird looking branch that he's holding and he pulls it off and it turns out it was secretly a sheath. That actually would have been cool to see, but they didn't show that. So I had to watch this like three times to figure out exactly what was going on. It's like, okay, so he picks up a stick, but it turns out that's actually a, a sheath. Because watching it the first time, I, I didn't catch that he even had a stick because it was so dark. And then the second time I was like, wait a minute, that's a stick. But then I hear metal clashing and then he's got a sword. Magic. 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 It wasn't until the third time watching it that I go, oh, I think that was a sheath dis disguised as a stick, which would have been cool and it would have explained how he brought his sword into the insane asylum, but they didn't show it in a way that you can even see it unless you literally pause and watch it. And that takes you outside of the narrative. So anything that causes you to have to pause in order to understand or to have to go and look up on the internet, on your phone, like I, what, who is this character? Or what, how did they meet? What's going on? Like anything that makes you have to, in order to understand what's going on, you have to leave the material as it is playing out is a sign of bad storytelling. That's something that should have been in there, something that should have been presented in such a way that you don't have to remove yourself from the storytelling in order to go and discover. Because what happens is you risk somebody going off and doing that and then losing interest, not coming back, or just being out of the mode. You've built up all of this suspense and then people are going, where did his sword come from? And they have to pause and rewind. And now all of the tension that built up from like, what's going on? Oh my gosh, there's a fade coming out of the shadows right there. It's disappeared because they spent so much time trying to figure out where his sword came from. Bad directing, bad editing. But so when he's off investigating what sound there was, the Fade comes out and attacks him from behind, but Celine is like, Rand! And he turns around and he fights the Fade and we can't see anything because everything is cut too quickly. Like there's not enough time to see motion even and it's all too close. But he eventually uh, gets disarmed by the Fade and he's backed up against the cliff edge with Celine, which means that I think in that scene where they were on the ridge before, that the cabin was right there. And for some reason, they just chose not to show it. Maybe they didn't have the budget to show a cabin in CGI. I don't know. Who knows? I don't, and I don't care. But they're backed up against the the cliff edge, and he says, stay behind me. And then he starts channeling, and he blasts the fade to kingdom come. It's dead. And that's when Lanfear runs out and she's like, what the hell did you just do? Did you just channel? And he's like, I'm so sorry. I should have told you that I can channel, but you know, I haven't gone mad. I promise I'm not mad. You should know that I haven't gone mad. And she goes, what about my inn? I, you know, burning down, was that you? And, and he's like, no, I, it was an accident. I'm so sorry, but uh. So Selene is still spooked and Rand goes, I'm sorry, I'm going to go now. Thank you for everything. I'm so sorry, I just wish that we, it doesn't matter. And he starts to leave and she goes, well, wait, where are you gonna go? He says, they say when men go mad, they kill the people that they love first. So I'm gonna get as far away from here as I can. And she goes, are you saying that you love me? That's so romantic. He doesn't respond to this, confirming or denying it. Why didn't you tell me you can channel? You are the first woman who's ever seen me as a man. I didn't want you to see me as a monster. This is all fine. I guess this is supposed to be the confirmation that he doesn't say or admit that he loves her or he's in love with her. Although he just said they kill the first, they kill the people that they love first. So I'm gonna get as far away from here as possible. So he is, he has said that he loves her. But then when she asked him, he doesn't say it. And then uh, here, when he has the opportunity to express love for her, he, all he says is, you're the first person who's, woman who's ever seen me as a man, which isn't really love. That's just like, <laughs> I'm so glad you, you like me. <laughs> then we get some more very interesting dialogue from Celine. Again, this ties back into something that I have heard, which is that the Dark One and all of the Forsaken and the people who are, you know, part of the Dark One, they're like pure evil. They're all, they are corruption. There is nothing true or sympathetic about them. That may, maybe I'm wrong, but I've heard this before from others. So 
What she says next, being something that is true, makes me wonder, are they making her too sympathetic in the show? Like, is she too much of a good guy when she's actually supposed to be just pure corruption? What you did, it's just part of your nature. You shouldn't hide it. I did that once. Turned my soul to him like a mirror, reflecting only what he wanted to see. Leaving the rest of me in darkness. But one day he looked too long. Too carefully. You need to give someone the chance to love all of you. They might not, but you have to give them the chance. She says, you need to give someone the chance to love all of you. Like, you need to be completely honest. Otherwise, you cannot, all of you cannot be loved. Like, if somebody loves you, but you've hidden part of yourself, you haven't even given them the opportunity to love all of you. But... The drawback to this is that if she, she's implying that once Luz Theron did know all of her, he didn't love her anymore. So what does she think about that? She says, they might not love all of you, but you have to give them the chance. This is such a wonderful truth. It's giving me a sour taste, though, because I have it in my head, having heard it so many times before, that she is not supposed to be this sympathetic character. She's supposed to be somebody who, she's like the girl who latches on to the most popular guy because he's the most popular guy. She likes the power that comes from being, from basically <laughs> riding on his coattails kind of a thing. And maybe she really did feel like she loves him, but it was her corrupt sense of love, which is, I love the power, if that makes sense. Which is why she's always pushing him to be more of a leader, to take his position of power. She's not satisfied with him in his current place. She wants him to go further. And that's where she wants to love him because she is angry at him when he doesn't do that. And I'm talking about in the book, that's how it is. So anyway, back to the show. I don't know how much time we have until I'm- The same as everyone else, never enough. And so she has accepted him and all of him. At this point, we have the convergence of three storylines. We've got um, the uh, uh, Alana and her two warders are reading that prophecy about Lanfear. And um, then we've got Moraine, who's obviously on her way. But what the prophecy says is this, daughter of the night, she walks again, the ancient war she yet fights. Her new lover she seeks, who shall serve her and die, yet serve her still, or yet serve still. And we can see her tying Rand up and we're expecting more of this uh, dominance banging that they've been doing up until now. They've, they're taking it to that level. <laughs> She's tying him up on the bed and he seems to just be like, okay, who shall stand against her coming? The shining walls shall kneel. The only protest we get from Rand at this point is he goes, uh, Celine. <laughs> Stop, don't come back. But she's still gone. Blood feeds blood. Blood calls blood. Blood is, blood was, and blood shall ever be. And at this point, Celine is kissing him all down, you know, leading down. But then she comes back up and she kind of whispers in his ear um, that there's something uh, I haven't told you. I'm a monster too. And that's where we get the parallel. We've heard, now we're hearing the same music that was in the cold open where Ishamael let out one of the Forsaken and they were covered in blood. And we're seeing the same images, you know, so we're, we all, we get it. This is land fear. And Rand goes, uh, what do you mean? As she's like sitting up on top of him and she starts channeling, but from Rand's perspective, all we see is like a slight ripple in the air. So I'm wondering if this is the first time that we're seeing in the show that a man cannot see that a woman can channel. Like we can't see, he can't see what she's doing. The audience can't see what she's doing. I'm not sure why they've decided to not do it now when they've done it every other time in the past, but I, they're, they're doing it here. Now you can see the little ripples in the air. I think it's supposed to be that you really, if as a man, he should not be able to see anything, but that distinction has not been made in the show. I don't think, I can't remember if it, if it hasn't been said in the show. Have they said in the show, men cannot see women channeling and women cannot see men channeling? I mean, we've seen that they can. We've seen that Loghain could see Nynaeve channel, but I'm not sure if we've seen, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so she starts channeling and Rand starts freaking out. And right as it seems like something's about to happen, we see a blade shoot out through Lanfear's chest, right where her heart would be. And then Moraine appears and slits 
the, her throat and tosses her off to the side and then cuts Rand free. She was sneaky. She got into that cabin without a sound and without one of the Forsaken noticing her approaching. Stealth mode, stealth mode. What's that mean? Like ducking? Yes, duck. Stealth mode means duck. Rand okay. freaks out and looks at Moraine. You killed her and blasts her against the wall with the one power and then comes up to her and grabs her by the throat and says, you killed her. And Moraine goes, I haven't. I couldn't, because that is Lanfear, daughter of the night, most dangerous of the Forsaken. Her name is Selene. She owns an air of I'm lying to you, which I never can. I can't lie! He lets her go. He kind of gets a hold of the power again, which, I mean, he's, he's figured out how to channel now, right? This seemed to be by choice that he controlled himself. And she's like, okay, we need to run. Rand grabs his sword and his jacket and Moraine's like, hurry. And they go running out of there. And as they're leaving, the camera pans down and you can see that Lanfear's eyes flash with darkness. And then she blinks like she's still alive. And uh, I don't know, I think you can see her neck healing. It doesn't matter. Either way, that's the end of the episode. This is actually good. I liked this too. I didn't I didn't like it as much as I enjoyed the Leandrin stuff, only because Leandrin's story has been consistently interesting through this entire season. Lanfears has not really. They've just been bang buddies for the whole season. And then suddenly in this episode alone, she starts doing her Lanfear stuff where she's trying to entice Rand to become the powerful leader. And then she reveals herself and then Moraine kills her. Like, I, okay. I, and I, I am surprised. I, I got to wonder, like, are the Forsaken immortal? Like, could you kill them in this life? But then they'll like pop up somewhere else and then they can come back. Because Lanfear indicated in the previous episode, I'm, I'm not afraid of you. Let, you know, just let it go. Just channel. And I, and my question then was, can she die? Can the dragon not kill her? So I don't know what the rules are. It's still very unclear. And when the rules are not stated specifically, I can't be surprised when a rule, when a loophole in the rules is exposed. Because to me, it just looks like I have no idea what the limits of the power are. And so anything could happen. You could have Lanfear be exploded by uh, fireworks. She could literally be in tiny p ground beef pieces everywhere. And if her body decided to reassemble and, sh and she's alive again, I wouldn't be surprised. She'd be like the Terminator in Terminator 2 or like Alex Mack, for those of you who grew up in the early 90s. Anyway. That's all I got for this episode. Not a whole lot, really. As I expressed earlier in this review, I just don't care about any of these characters. I have no investment in any of them. Elaine hasn't been present enough to be pleasant enough in the show. Leandrin, I thought was fine and interesting, but I have my reservations about her because what is this screwing up in the future? I don't know. But anyway, no matter what, it's very difficult to get through this show. I That's all I got. Blech. If it wasn't the worst thing ever, please like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. If you're feeling unreasonably generous, uh, check out my Patreon or Ko-fi or hit the Money Heart Thanks button down below. I do take just tips at at least Ko-fi and the Money Heart Thanks button so you don't have to like be a constant membership thing, whatever, you get the idea. Anyway, that's it. Be good to yourself. <laughs>